Hello, everyone. I'd like to start with a quote. Um, this is a quote by the late John Berger. He was an English novelist and art critic. John said, with their parallel lives, animals offer man a companionship which is different from any offered by human exchange. Different because it is a companionship offered to the loneliness as man as a species. So to help illustrate John's point, uh, show of hands, how many people have ever lived with an animal in the same house, fish, dog, cat? <laughs> yeah, it's most of us, right? There are scenes like this that is familiar to us, a large animal in a vehicle. <laughs> this is actually my brother, Eamon, with his dog, Willem. And Willem was a very clever dog. Uh, he figured out really quickly that he could get out of the vehicle. He could just open the doors. You get in my brother's truck and he would jam screwdrivers and different tools, blocks of wood, in the door frame so that Willem couldn't open it up. And so we domesticated this animal, the wolf. This is a, an image by Robert Clark, a story about the domestication of wolves. I think the agent for this Maltese uh, is gonna get some feedback here. The Maltese doesn't look too excited to be standing under that big animal. But there's an archeological dig site there um, in the corner that shows a skeleton of a 12,000 year old man clutching a puppy. So it's this idea that we have this connection to this wild animal different than any other. It's the first animal we domesticated some 30, 40,000 years ago in Eurasia. And so just a quick overview of uh, the gray wolf in North America. This is a map of their current and historic range. Historic range is the light orange and the darker is their current range. So I live in Montana. Um, we have about 800 gray wolves, which is considered a success. Uh, just last week was the 25 year anniversary of the wolves being brought back into Yellowstone National Park. There's, as I said, 800, but in the late 1800s, from 1888 onwards, every year on average, there were about 5,000 wolf pelts submitted for bounty claims in Montana alone. There are 5,000 wolves total in the lower 48 now. And why is that? Why was this eradication of this animal so prevalent, whereas now we love it? We got rid of the wolf and we replaced it with the Maltese and various other things. It's because they eat the same things we do, and we fear them. And this is an image I made in Yellowstone, uh, my first project for National Geographic in 2015. And this image is of wolves that are scared of people, right? It's forward facing, they're kind of fearful of us, and we feel that. So they were absent from the landscape before they were brought back into Yellowstone. As I said, 25 year anniversary bringing wolves back to Yellowstone was last week. And so the issues around Yellowstone are with the lifestyle that Westerners brought to and imposed on the landscape of the West, ranching, raising very uh, dumb animals, really. Uh, we dumbed down the wild counterparts in Eurasia, we brought them to Europe, and so they make for easy prey now and then for wolves. On average in Montana, they lose about 50 cows a year to wolves. Um, last winter, they lost 30,000 cows to weather. It's uh, important to realize that Yellowstone was created for the geothermal features, features like this, the Canary Springs and Mammoth Hot Springs. So the borders were drawn not for what the wildlife needed or what the ecosystem needed, but for what was convenient to preserve those geothermal features. Yellowstone is a massive supervolcano. Average elevation of Yellowstone is above uh, 8,000 feet. So it means it's a very harsh place to be in winter. And so the, the idea of Yellowstone as a blueprint of habitat for the rest of the West isn't necessarily accurate because it's this unique place, this volcano. But Yellowstone and the wolf relationship there is about research and about tourism. And so this is a research helicopter that is being flown over a pack of wolves to put a collar on it, a tracking device on the animal. This is Doug Smith hanging out of the helicopter on a harness, trying to put a dart in the rump of that wolf. Once they get him down, they go through a protocol of general health checks, DNA samples, and they put those collars on. These are newer GPS tracking collars so they can figure out their movements. Are they leaving the park very often? How big are their home ranges? How are the packs interacting? And what are they mainly feeding on? 
And so this is a diorama or a piece of art from a National Geographic magazine article um, in early 2000 showing the difference in habitat from the wolves being brought back into the landscape, showing that they have a huge impact on the success and the health of the landscape. One, you have too many elk, and the other, you have a more balanced ecosystem when you replace just a single animal known as a keystone species. And so in Yellowstone, I spent much of my time failing, uh, as is the case with things that are scared of you. Um, I couldn't imagine what it would be like to try to chase people down that were scared of you and try to take their picture. It would be a challenge, and your images would reflect that. This is a remote camera. This is a motion-triggered camera. So when the animal is aware of the camera, they're scared of it, they're seeing and, and hearing the noise, click, 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 of this tool. And so after this project ended, I really felt a need uh, to understand more about the, the real wolf, the wolf that is not afraid of you, um, and try to tell a better story about them. I never saw wolf pups. I never saw much socialization going on in Yellowstone. They just weren't relaxed whenever I was within a couple hundred feet or even a quarter mile. Once they would smell me, it was, it was game over. And so I knew, uh, as many of us did, uh, of, of this place. This is a cover by Jim Brandenburg, the photo. Um, and National Geographic sent Jim Brandenburg and a biologist named David Meech up to Ellesmere Island. It's the furthest northern landmass in Canada. It's about 700 miles from the North Pole. And this was a place where the wolves there had never had a negative encounter with humans. There were no humans living there permanently. There was no livestock, no competition with humans. And so I pitched the project, it was approved, went up to this very barren seemingly landscape that is treeless. Um, it's kind of rolling badlands, prairie-esque feel. But it's a place that has a lot of life, obviously. Um, the wolves are there and other species. And so just quick overview where we're at. This is 80 degrees north. It's right next to Greenland. And the wolves there, as I said, they don't have any fear of humans. And so instead of using camera traps, you can get in front of them while they're traveling, lie down with a 24 millimeter lens, and they walk past you. This was after spending about three weeks with this pack of wolves. And you could also use camera traps, but you could use them in more intimate settings um, at the den, and they ignore it, they urinate on it, becomes part of the landscape. <laughs> You clean the lens, and then you're good to go. <laughs> and so the pack that I spent the most time with um, was this pack. This is 10 wolves total. There are six adults and four pups. A couple down here, these are the shaggy yearlings. These two are the females. They were two-year-olds, incredibly skilled huntresses. This one, one eye. She had one eye and half a tail. She was quite a wolf. And the two adults, uh, the breeders on the top there. And I'll let them introduce themselves. named them the polygon pack because these polygon tundra ponds are something unique to the high Arctic. They formed over thousands of years, and this was very close to their den site. And so I thought today, uh, in an effort to kind of better introduce us all to the life of a wolf, from here on out, I'm going to show you images that were created on over the course of two days. This was a uh, about 35 to 40 hours that I was spent with them, following them while they were hunting and pushing on, they were very hungry. And I thought that this would just be a way for us to just dive into a day in the life of a wild wolf. And so the day started, uh, I took about 12 hours to find them, and then once I engaged them, they were in the midst of a hunt, and they hunt musk oxen, which is a large relative of the goat. Males weigh about 800 pounds, and it is this 
like long dance that goes on, this process. It's not what we think of as like they run in and they quickly successfully take down an animal. It's a dance that this one lasted for over six hours where they would push the herd, but the herd also works together to defend themselves. And this is a, obviously a formidable line for the wolves to try and penetrate. There was a large male that was associated with this pack. And so most of the time, the wolves are unsuccessful here. They're sent packing. And it's an opportunity for the wolves also to, to learn and to figure out how to hunt these animals. The, one of the yearling males, he was the largest wolf by body size, but he was not the best hunter. He was awkward, he would get in the way of the other adults, he would kind of stumble around, he would come in at the end when all the work had been done. <laughs> and so it, it's a testament to just how much they have to learn. You know, like human hunters, we are born with physical and mental attributes as humans, but we can hunt many different things, but we have to be taught how, and wolves are the same. And so during these hunts, the pups are nearby. At this time, they were about eight weeks old. And so they're kind of still long-legged, gangly looking things, but uh, they're able to keep up. And it's an important learning phase for them to watch how the adults move and, and learn to hunt these animals. So this went on for a while and then uh, they took a nap. They slept for about seven hours on and off. I did my best to get some rest as well. And then they're on again. And what they are are coursing predators, is what wolves are. So meaning they travel the landscape long distances, hoping to bump into some prey. They found these musk oxen again, different herd, uh, long ways away. But the musk oxen here kind of had this nice little fortified wall behind them and it didn't last long. The wolves just tested them for about 20 minutes. They went down along sea level here. This is along one of the fjords along Ellesmere. And they eventually went up to over 2,500 feet. So the lowest point in their home range up to the highest. They bumped into another herd. Uh, this one also had a very strong male musk oxen. You'll see down at the bottom. And in this next clip, uh, the challenge can be that you really have to respect these guys. <laughs> they're big, they're quick, uh, and it's impressive to see how much the wolves obviously respected that. Um, I'll, this next clip's gonna play. Um, all the audio I should mention is by uh, um, Inuk throat singer, her name's Tanya Tagak, uh, and this next clip will just be her voice and music over the action. So that was one of the two-year-old females. Uh, she ended up being fine, they carried on. Uh, that was just a normal day for her <laughs> in her pursuit to try to get food. You know, wolves exist in this strange realm uh, as an animal where they literally have to put their life at risk just to eat, um, which there's other predators that hunt smaller game than they do, uh, or smaller game than they weigh, um, so it's not as much of a challenge. But here we are carrying on our way here. Uh, they have these kind of bulletin board sites, I kind of called them, where it's an old carcass site that they would routinely visit, market, smell other wolves that had maybe come through the area, and it was a chance for the young to be able to figure out the pups. If they get lost, go to the bulletin board and figure out what's going on. 
bumped into a, a lone male. Um, they thought maybe this would be a nice opportunity, but again, these are relatives of, of goats, the musk oxen, and so they take cover down anything they can get their back end up against, and it was a Quick little dash, again, a couple minutes just to test to see if he had a limp or if there was some weakness they could exploit. They carried on, checked the nearby bulletin board. And then they went for a different prey that's located on the island, a smaller prey. This is an Arctic hare. And it looks like a lot of effort for potentially just a, a 10 pound reward. 10 pounds is a large hare, mind you. Um, but as you can see, they're much more nimble. They're quicker than the wolves are. They did get one, uh, but they were all very hungry. And this is the pups trying to beg to one of the yearlings who doesn't want to share. They go to the old male, try to get him to regurgitate some pre-chewed meal. They broke it up with some, some play after they had at least a, a couple bites of food in their belly. Uh, we were at this point at about, I think, 40 miles of distance traveled over the course of the, the two days. But yeah, relieve some stress play a little bit, and then they were pushing higher in elevation in their home range, and they were going, again, for more of these Arctic hares, going higher and higher up along this plateau, got into some snowy areas, um, and I'll let this clip play on its own as well. Looks like a lot of energy for no reward. Um, they seemed hopeful in that chase, but it, it didn't work out. As soon as the hares go up to higher ground, the wolves just can't keep up, they can't chase them. So I followed them up, they crossed over this pass and they dropped down this narrow, basically avalanche chute. Uh, and they all go over and they pile over and I'm photographing and the pups go over and I go to follow them. Um, a machine that I was using is an ATV four-wheeler. Uh, it's, it's just like an off-road motorcycle with four wheels. Get off that, walk over this area and it's sheer ice. It, it just drops off and I see these slide marks of all the wolves. And it's too steep, it's probably a 65, 70 degree pitch. And I think that they are gone, that they must have just poofed off into a bunch of rocks. This is this was what I thought maybe was the last photo that I was going to take in relation to these animals. It took me a couple hours to figure out a way to get down um, this steep plateau, get to a point where I can see their tracks traversing down that drainage, and I think you know I don't see anything. I don't see any bodies piled up or anything, and I eventually an hour later find them, <laughs> and. They're just curled up. This is just a, a normal day for them in, in the life of these wild wolves. Uh, for me, it was an incredibly challenging uh, experience, all the technology in the world trying to keep up with them. I was wrecked, destroyed, exhausted, been up for 40 hours, photographed and filmed all of this over the course of that time, um, and realizing that this is, these wolves are kind of living these, these present daily lives uh, in the moment, cooperatively working together to achieve things that they can on their own. And, and in many ways, that's the human happy place as well. And in, in closing, I'm gonna read another quote 
Um, this one is by the late Fred Woodruff. Um, Mr. Woodruff was an elder with the Quailu tribe of uh, Northwest Washington, the Olympic Peninsula. And Mr. Woodruff said, we learned from the wolf how to survive and how to be more human, how to honor our elders, to protect and provide for our families. And we learned from wolves the loyalty you need to really belong to a tribe. Thank you.